If you're ready to take your destiny into your own hands, you've come to the right place. This is The Bulletproof Entrepreneur, featuring interviews with the most exciting and amazing entrepreneur. Here's your host, Chi Odogu. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to the show today. If you love what you hear on today's episode of the podcast, go to iTunes and leave a review and a comment. It helps other great listeners like yourself find the show. And of course, you can always find more episodes of the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Podcast at www.odogwu.com. And without further ado, on with the show. Hey everybody, this is Chi Odogo here with the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Podcast. I have another Valentine's Day special interview. I'm talking to Phil Singleton. Phil is a web designer and an SEO expert and an award-winning author. Since 2005, Phil has owned and operated a digital agency based out of Kansas City. In 2016, Phil and John Jans of Duct Tape Marketing co-wrote SEO for Growth, the ultimate guide for marketers, web designers, and entrepreneurs. In addition to writing that book, Phil has about two or three other books out on Amazon. Let me look at it here. There's a marketing guide for local SEO, how to hire a web designer, and um, Google AdWords, marketing guide, Google AdWords. So, I mean, he's a prolific writer, and he's here to tell us a little bit about his business experience, his life, how he founded his agency, and of course, the art of writing a book, because I was telling him right in the green room before we started recording that I want to write a book and, you know, I just have that um, block that's been keeping me from writing a book. And he went from zero to book in, in six months and it became a bestseller. So I'd like to extract some of those words of wisdom and learn how to replicate his um, success. So with that said, Phil, welcome to the show. Gee, thank you so much for having me. It's going to be fun. Great. So, Phil, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. How did you get to becoming an agency owner in Kansas City? It's really um, funny because I took a very unconventional path. Mm-hmm. I, um, you know, I went to school for finance. I'm kind of an introvert by nature, mm-hmm. um, and I ended up actually in college. I got a D in computer science, so it's kind of funny to think that I'm doing anything <laughs> computer related and actually making you know a good living off of it now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I rolled out of college into the exciting career of um, an insurance company, mm. and it was like three or four years in, into that that I was like, I knew that's not what I wanted to do for the rest mm. of my life. Um, and what I ended up doing over the course of a two-week period at the very end was packing up my bags and moving to Asia. Mm. Wow. And uh, yeah, I know my parent, it wasn't really, I guess people didn't think it was cool back at the time. I yeah. thought it was kind of be a cool adventure, but I think people thought kind of I lost my mind. But I really just wanted to do something different. I knew I had to do something maybe drastic mm-hmm. to burst myself out of the bubble or the trajectory that I was going and change my direction. Mm. Um, so I made a you know a hard right turn into an adventure and basically moved to Asia, you know, changed my whole life. I started wow. studying Mandarin. I met my wife out there. She's Taiwanese. Okay. Um, I lived in Taiwan for about 10 years, ended up getting, coming back and getting my MBA and then got a job right out of school. Um, grad school took me back to Taiwan. So in total, I was there for 10 years, but, but it was during that end of that 10 year period in Asia where I actually ended up just long story, but I'll make a long story short, mm-hmm. a software company ended up kind of falling into my lap. Mm-hmm. Um, because I happened to be doing some finance related things in Asia during kind of the dot com era. And this company, this ended up for a lot of different business reasons, had to kind of shut down in the States. Okay. And I just be happened to be at the right place at the right time. So at that time we were selling consumer software all around the world, but okay. a lot of our sales were coming from this is back going back more than fifteen years ago. Mm. A lot of our sales even at that time were coming from affiliate marketers. So these guys okay. would have, you know, forums or their own like precursors to blog type thing where they had a lot of traffic. Yeah. Um, you know, we'd be putting an advertisement up on their site. They click through to our site. We'd mm-hmm. end up paying them the big ones, like 50% of a sale. Okay. So here I am not knowing how this stuff works, but I saw, Hey, I'm running this company. I'm having to write commission checks to these guys for like 50, 70, $80,000 a month. Wow. And here we had 25 employees, software development, customer support, investors, our piece of that 50% got whittled down to almost nothing. Wow. These other guys we were maybe just one of several affiliates that they had mm-hmm. probably weren't working all that much every day and we're getting a you know, major bank. I was like, wow, we're on the wrong side of the equation Inclusion, here. Yeah. So that really opened my eyes up and I was like, okay. Um, again, even going back 15 years ago, Google was super powerful for mm-hmm. people looking for stuff online, driving a lot of sales. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, 
that venture ended up rolling up. We moved back to Taiwan, really, uh, to, to the States, I mean, back to Kansas City. Um, and there was a nice payday for me to get out of that venture, but it wasn't something like in my mid-30s that I could not do anything for the rest of my life and like buy an yeah. island type of thing. Yeah. It was nice to be able to come back and buy a house and do this kind of stuff. But um, I was kind of fumbling around. And while we moved back to the States and I figured, hey, you know what? Um, I happened to run into this one guy who, you know, he bought a car. I bought a car and this guy happened to be an auto detailer. It's kind of a little hole in the wall, little shop that he was ended up um, basically selling auto details for like $25 a car. Okay. To the auto detailer, so he was making like nothing because he was like a subcontractor mm-hmm. for for used car or new car sales. And I told this guy because he I happened to be introduced. I was like, you should have your own website because um, you could be selling to end users like myself for maybe a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars a car um, type of a thing. So I did this thing on a barter. Thirty five years old, never had done a website. Saw the power of the internet and S kind of from afar and mm-hmm. learned a little bit about it in that in that job in my last job in Taiwan. Mm-hmm. So I ended up doing a, a barter deal with him and I made a promise I couldn't keep and I'm in 2005 I made my first one page website wow. in Dreamweaver. 2 months later the guy calls me back literally with like tears in his I can hear it in his voice saying, "Phil, I don't know what you've done. You've changed my business, you've changed my life." Wow. Um, and I was like, "Wow, 35, I finally know what I want to be when I grow up. Yeah. I'm going to help these small business owners." One, because it was the most rewarding thing that had happened to me ever professionally. Mm -hmm. Um, But two, I was like, I can make some money off of this. You know, if you can help somebody grow their business, um, you can really make some good money. So that one little barter website kind of as a second career started an an agency where we've got literally scores of, of, you know, retainer based clients. But we've done it well over five or six hundred, you know, custom websites in the last 10 years. So. Um, it's become a nice boutique agency that's, that's helped make a good living. And that, that's kind of the story okay. from D to Asia to um, kind of a weird wild ride through affiliate marketing. And yeah. then one little website, you know, I made a promise I couldn't, I didn't think I was going to be able to keep or I just figured, hey, you know what, if I fail on this, I'll hire somebody okay. else and I'll make good on it. But sometimes you got to make those kind of promises yeah. and put yourself up limb, right, to make yeah. it make a difference. And I'm sure glad I did because it felt a little bit scary at the time mm-hmm. to, to not a web designer, <laughs> but um, you know, I, I did it and I am now and it's worked. Nice, nice. I love that story. Before we move any further though, um, I just want to explore a little bit your adventure in Asia because I, before you left, you know, you had an existential crisis, so to speak. You were fi- trying to figure out what you were going to do with your life. You knew that that wasn't what you were doing wasn't it. And then you I was to miserable, be, miserable, yeah. yeah. And I, and I think a lot of people that listen to podcasts like this, you know, are looking for that escape, you know, to find meaning in their life. You know, we all know that we go to school. We're told, go to school, get your degree, do well, find a corporate job, work in the job. And then, of course, they'll take care of you. But that's not that's not been happening in recent years, you know, even yeah. as far as back when you went to college and you came out. So tell us a little bit about, you know, what you learned in Asia, the essence of what focused you to say, okay, I want to find a way to channel myself to doing something that's meaningful and something that at least I'll enjoy and I'll have a broad spectrum career. Well, I'd love this question because I think a couple of things really have, um, I've realized, I guess, hindsight's twenty twenty. looking back at how the one job that I had, and I was happy to have a job walking out of graduation out because at the end it's like yeah, for those people that don't have a silver spoon or whatever you got to start making money right away yeah. and to start paying bills and kind of stuff so it's really grateful to have a job first week out of school but what I, you don't really realize or I didn't realize at the time is sometimes that those first steps out of wherever it is high school or college mm-hmm. especially when you're jumping into a career you don't realize how much that can have to start putting you down a path because mm-hmm. you start just because you need money, you start sometimes, or at least I did back back then in the day, it was kind of like you start accumulating a skill set just because the job was available. Because who really knows what they want to do when they're 21 or 22 yeah. years old? You just want some professional experience. Mm-hmm. But for me, I felt myself getting pulled down a path that wasn't my destiny. It was somebody 
else's. And I didn't want to make a parallel move into something that was almost financial related or just jump into another insurance company. I was Mm -hmm. like, for me, I was like, I got to do something really different because it feels like my whole life is going that way when it should be going that way. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I made that. But the other thing that was really big at that time is I realized I had felt like I had a false sense of confidence in college. Okay. And as soon as I got out into the real world, I was overwhelmed with anxiety. Mm -hmm. I had all of a sudden realized I had self-esteem and confidence issues. Mm. Very hard for me to relate or talk to people. Well, professional sense, because I just got really nervous. And I think that just came from just having a rude awakening of being, hey, you're this guy in college and maybe yeah. trying to skate by and do whatever you can to have fun, mm-hmm. get out into the real world. And all of a sudden it's like, wow, um, it's just life really kind of changed. So for me, making that move, I was a really scared person with low confidence, high anxiety out of school. Mm-hmm. But when I went to Asia and I made that move, I ended up gaining so much confidence Mm. by being able to go to a new place where I knew nobody and start to make a living and build a career in a different place and have to learn to adapt. Somehow over that experience, Mm. I realized in myself was like, geez, you know, if I can do this, I can probably pretty much do anything. Yeah. Um, and that's how I feel today. I feel like if I didn't really go through that experience and push myself to the limit and realize that, you know, I found a way to survive and thrive and somewhere in a totally different culture like you um, in another know the language. language. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, I ended up getting the type of confidence that I feel like now it doesn't matter if it's web design or whatever else. If I get my teeth into something, I know I've got the tenacity and the ability to kind of figure it out. I just didn't have that early on. I was afraid I was never going to get it. But that, so you do a lot of things going into different, it's great to you know adapt and see different cultures, kind of opens your mind up. Um, and I think enables you to, I think, look at the world and look at people in, in a totally different kind of an open way. That stuff's all great. But for me, the real benefit I think of going to Asia was um, it just gave me a ton of confidence, which yeah. has made me be much more, I think, happy and a more productive person all the way around. Yeah. And I actually think that confidence was what drove you to say, yes, I'm going to make this website. Even though you had never made a website before, you didn't even know what Dreamweaver, I'm sure websites were very difficult to make back in the day. Yeah. I don't, the first time I ever looked at making a website was 2012. So I can only imagine um, 10 years. 2005. Yeah, I think actually <laughs> yeah. it started with Dreamweaver. It was too hard. I ended up making that first one. Actually, it was in Microsoft front page. I don't know if that wow. rings a bell, but that's not even around anymore. <laughs> yeah. But, but um, that was what I had to build it in the first one. Wow, that's 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 really cool. So you did that, you know. Then you helped this local business owner and transformed his um, business, so to speak. Um, talking about this local businesses, so how did you start acquiring clients once you got that first one? Because that one kind of like was a butter thing, but. You have to First couple up. ones, really. Oh, really? Harder. Yeah. So what were you bought her in for? Oh, God, the first one. So it was the auto detail on that one. He ended up you know, doing a deal where I think I ended up getting a commission off of stuff that he was getting on the website. So okay. still not a whole lot, but okay. it felt great to monetize and make something off of it. Um, but there was like a landscaper and then um, a couple other ones that were just, I think, home related. Where I was like, let me hit some of these home services because they can you know, end up doing some stuff. But at some point, my wife was like, hey, you can't keep giving stuff away for free. For free. <laughs> um, but, but really, in the beginning, for me, I think this could happen for anywhere. The beginning... What I realized early on was doing some stuff and a barter, if you can set it up and making sure that the people know that there's value Mm -hmm. and knowing that their role for me was I need you to be one of my screamer referrals. Okay. So that's huge to be able to go to somebody and then start charging them and Mm -hmm. say, you go to this guy and have the guy be able to pick up the phone and say, these deliver, you need to pay him whatever he's charging type of a thing. That was huge for me. And I, nice. I don't know if I was just smart or lucky to be able to do that, but I figured I need to have a base of some people that can that are social proof before mm-hmm. we were calling it social proof. proof yeah. um, and I still think that's a great thing today. And I've talked to a few people that don't – you know, everybody else gets too worried about giving too much away early. But if you're yeah. just getting started, you have to have some kind of a track record because yeah. people are looking for proof, especially if you're newer at it. I mean mm-hmm. it's even more important to have a track record. So. Mm-hmm. Um, I did that early on. The first couple ones were barters, and I kind of ended up raising, kept raising my prices up until mm-hmm. you know I was kind of getting it. But that that was huge. And even to this day, I think use and things like that are more important than ever. Yeah, you know what I mean. So being able to find some way to document your, um, your the success. stuff that you've done yeah, is yeah. just that's what people are looking for to make decisions. So yeah, same yeah. same way. Then, same, yeah. like like you just said, if you move to a different location, like I just moved from. Uh, 
Lagos, Nigeria to Toronto, Canada to start a new business. And my clients were all in Nigeria. Now I'm in a different country. It's the same thing. You know, if I want to get people to talk about me, I need to start, you know, giving my services either at very low price points, which is, uh, you know, it, it, it's, a scary. Pain. it's a pain yeah. and it's scary when you have to do that. But you have to get those screaming memes that say, yes, talk to Chi, talk to John, talk to Phil. You know he's going. He's going to help you out. This is this this work wonders for my business, and you know you you need to actually get them to work with you. That's the only way you're going. I to think work. it's key. I mean, I don't look at it as giving stuff away. I look at it as an investment, investment. in yourself. Yeah. It's in yourself because if you can do it, you can get. It. But the key to me, that part of it is, you know, as soon as you give stuff away free, mm -hmm. you do cheapen your certain people. You got to uh, so you got to still find some way. Um, and I learned this after the first couple. I wanted to really let people know, like, I should be charging you for this. Mm -hmm. I'm getting this. Here's my expectation. Yeah. Here's the lines in the sand. It doesn't mean that you can call me for anything mm -hmm. um, type of a deal. But it also means your role in getting this thing for free is you're going to help me in these areas. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing it. So yeah. we got to find some way to make sure. Otherwise, as soon as you start, you know, that slippery slope mm -hmm. of giving mm -hmm. stuff for free, all of a sudden they're asking you to do everything. Everything. You know? Exactly. So you have to demonstrate you know? the value up front. You know, I say, hey, dude, this is worth five thousand dollars, but I'm just trying to get my name out there as I'm starting yes. this new region, and I'll do this for free. But there's a barrier; you can't go beyond this border. This is well, yeah, everything I'm willing to deliver. And all of a sudden, if you don't make those things clear, when you, the last thing you want to do is turn that good referral that you're working yeah, for into, into a, a negative, yeah. into a negative because you said no when they're like, wow. And I'm helping out. It's like, well, the value of your referral and the single is that is this amount. And we mm -hmm. got to make sure that we. But th I think that's why a lot of people don't say don't do it. But there is a way to make it work if you're clear about you know everybody's role and expectations ahead of time, mm -hmm. um, and they know what you're doing and see the value in a type of a deal. Mm -hmm. So these days, do you still go into the weeds making websites and doing SEO? Do you have a team that do all that stuff for you? I have a team, but I'm more in at this stage of my business. Mm -hmm. I'm way more into the weeds than I know I should be. But okay. this year, I've actually taken some steps to be like, I'm going to systemize okay. um, a lot more of it. And I've actually got a new person on that's really been able to take kind of my role and get me out. Because I'm trying to do more of the mm -hmm. stuff that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Personal branding, getting out there, podcasting, um, you know, building out some of those things yeah. out, out and not being down in trying to do stuff. But, I mean, that's the stuff that got me involved and I like yeah. it. And um, plus, so much of what we do is based on building – lead generating website. Yes. So my fear is if I take that out and I start losing that mm -hmm. critical, I mean, that's kind of like my money making skill there yeah. um, that I'm going to lose. I want to bat a thousand basically. Yeah. And you got to figure out at some point to make sure that I'm, I'm involved in the quality stays there. But I think that's the classic e-myth yeah. problem that everybody has at some point. It's like, how do you scale yourself out? So, but I know I've kind of hit a little bit of a barrier yeah. and I probably should be two or three times as big as I have in terms of revenue based yeah. on the amount of leads that we get. Yeah. But, um, you know, I've hit that thing where if I don't systemize things a little bit better, um, I'm either going to stay where I am or, um, you know, not going to be able to grow. So, mm. I, do you have a partner in the business right now or you're the CEO? I don't. Okay. I don't. I figure I've got a guy potentially that could, you know, fill in that role later on. But, and I know some people have done that, but you can't just give away the farm oh, on yeah. day one. So yeah. <laughs> if somebody steps up and, and fills into that role, I'm, you know, more than happy to kind of have that happen. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm at that stage right here where also I see a lot of agencies, man. You know, I've been talking to some guys. One, I know one guy I was talking to as an agency coach was like, you know, he's, you see some of these agencies go from a million to 10 million or whatever it is. Mm. And the 10 million guys are sometimes making like 3% net margin. So mm. they get bigger, but they don't necessarily make more money. They got yeah. more headaches, you know, and I know a lot of people that end up making a lot more money at a certain level. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they try and grow it out, feast or famine type stuff, they yeah. end up in all sorts. Of, so it's like that's a little bit of a scary. I think mean, that's all business type things too. Yeah. But, um, you know, I wouldn't be in a comfortable life because I got an agency. I've got an office. But I also like the ability to have a little bit of that lifestyle element because yeah. I can work from home or do stuff like yeah. I don't want to lose that really because, <laughs> you know, I've got 20 people working in an office and I feel like i got to be there every day type of thing. Yeah, that, that makes a lot there's, of there's sense. There's seven of us now and most of us are remote. remote. We've got an office here for clients really and for podcasting and stuff. You know okay. what I mean? Okay. No, I love that because I think a lot of – there's this company I interviewed um, last year, Acceleration Partners, Robert Glazer, and they are one of the largest affiliate marketing companies in, in the world right now, and they have no offices. 
That's know, awesome. Everybody works from home and they just go to either Starbucks or they find somewhere if they want to meet clients. But other than that, everybody's completely 100% distributed. If they what a dream. To, if they need to go see a client, they go to a client's office or something like that, which is great. So, so I want to ask you one quick technical question before we get into duct tape marketing, which is, I think I read somewhere that, um, well, somebody was trying to make a, one of those statements that SEO is dead mm. in uh, 2018. That, you know, maybe with changes coming up by Google or something, or even the rise of AI chatbots and what have you, that traditional SEO is probably going to go away, that we have to create more content in order to get ourselves out there and generate leads. Do you think that is a, is an actual factual statement? Do you think there's any... Does it hold any water? I, you know, I don't really. I think the traditional definition of what people think SEO is is dead, and that is tweaking the websites and finding you know holes and just trying to play games on the site, mm. and also doing volume-based link building yeah. and moving the needle there. Yeah. Um, that part of SEO is dying or is dead. Sure, there are certain things that still kind of work for short periods of time, but it's mm. not sustainable. Yeah. But the reality is, look. You know, four years ago, there were 3.5 billion searches a year, a day, um, 3.5 billion searches a day. Mm -hmm. um, and then today there's, or last year, I should say, it's in 2017, there were 5.5 billion searches per day. Mm -hmm. So it's vastly going up. There's more and more content going on to the web. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, how do we go about finding new information? Well, it's yeah. in your, either in your feeds or you search it. Mm -hmm. So the two ways I see people getting information are you follow stuff and you see it in real time yeah. or that good information gets documented on a web page and it's there for somebody to look up either on a search mm -hmm. or a voice search or whatever have you. But some way we need to get access to the more and more information yeah. and Google's got the stronghold on it. They're not yeah. going anywhere. It's a $700 billion company or whatever they are right now. Um, they've just got a lock on it and, yeah. you know, everybody's talking about voice and what people using voice assistant. There's more ways to get, you know, search and find information. So I don't think, I don't think it's that at all. The one thing that's really exciting about SEO is because it's become more holistic mm -hmm. and you, and Google's really done a great job in terms of putting the bullseye in the right place, which is content. Mm -hmm. Um, it's become more fun and more consulting based and less like offshore under the hood, dark okay. art. Right. Yeah. So where they really put it, if I think people are smart about SEO is, you know, you have to think about yourself on the Internet and not putting your best content on platforms that other people own. Mm. So to me, there's more of an onus on us uh, for people that are building personal branding and authority and trying to do those things. We were talking about social proof and mm. documenting your track record. It really, to me, makes your website more important than anything, mm. because when we do a podcast, we want people to come back to the site and yeah. see the show notes page. Yeah. When we do a great piece of whatever we're doing, we don't want to just put that up on social media. We want to mm -hmm. put it on our site and make people come back, come to, back it to it so we can pixel them and retarget them for other mm -hmm. stuff later. And we can build our own body of work yeah. up on a website that we own, not on Mark Zuckerberg's platform, yeah. on our own platform that we own. Yeah. You know, the more you document what you're doing, um, the more your site can become an answer to somebody else's question. Yeah. So, so now that you see, even as you see in search, what's exciting to me, it does wide open is you'll do a search for something and ask Google a question in a type mm -hmm. and you'll see knowledge boxes come up. Mm. The positions what, what, here. What's a knowledge box? Cause I'm not... Well, if you'll do like a search for, um, if you type like, what is something, what is SERP stacking? What is, um, what is podcast booking? If you'll do, you'll a lot of times you'll see like an answer box come up with a picture and the actual answer and the text okay. will come up instead of just the blue. Okay. So you're seeing like re results in Google search are becoming mm. richer. Yes. There's knowledge boxes and knowledge panels. Yes. There's actually like star ratings in there. Yes. So a lot of that has to do with people putting more information on your website. Okay. But you don't see Facebook posts coming up as answers. Yes. You yes. see web pages coming up. Mm -hmm. And those knowledge boxes are becoming the source of what a lot of things are pointing for the voice. Mm. So Google's saying, hey, your page, since you have a guide or a definitive answer to this type of question, mm -hmm. um, we're going to serve yours up as the answer to it, where people are going to see that. You're going to get more click-through rates. Mm -hmm. But it also is a good chance that's going to become part of maybe the voice answer on a voice okay. search. So these are the types of things where I think SEO has become more important. If you do it right and you document your answers and your things on your 
your web you have a chance to be an answer. Your content has a chance to be an answer to the rest of the world okay. um, for a question. It's wide open because one of the things that helps you to do that is one, you invest in content in your website. Yeah. Two, two, you do the traditional SEO optim and optimization in it. But three, there's another level of code now called structured data and schema. Okay which is an extra level of um, code where you basically can go on the back of your website. And if you use you know, WordPress, a lot of people are familiar with a basic SEO program called Yoast SEO, yes. which enables you to change your titles yep. and your meta description. Well, there's other plugins, right? I actually have my own that's been downloaded over 100,000 times wow. that what's, enables what's it you. Called? It's called WP um, SEO Schema. Okay. So what that does is enables you to go onto your blog page or your blog post and tag your content and tell Google what it is and give it some context. What do I mean by that? Well, if you've got a blog page and the blog page has a review on it, mm -hmm. Google normally won't go in and say, that looks like a review, so I'm gonna show that review up in the results. What they'll do is if you tag it and tell Google with this piece of code, hey, this is a review by John Jans and he gave it four stars on mm -hmm. this page. Sometimes they'll take that information if you tag it right and they'll show the star rating up in search results. Oh. Oh. As a result of a little bit of extra tagging and coding you do on your website. Okay. Well, that's wide open because 99% okay. of people don't tag their website. Yes. <laughs> I, do. I know I don't. <laughs> Almost that, nobody does. It's just because it's one of these extra things that Google's doing. But when you do and yeah. you do a search sometimes and you see stars come up or you see an yeah. event time come up, yeah. those are because people are taking the extra steps to okay. tag the data. And the more you can convince Google that you can give them that context, mm -hmm. the more likely they are to show extra information in the search results. And when people see that extra search engine bling, your click-through rates go up. Oh, so that th those are part of the things that help you move up in the rankings when you search on Google, correct? You, extra coding, people yeah. think that extra code thing, people think that's a ranking factor, although Google doesn't come out and say it. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that almost every SEO expert will tell you is, your own click-through rate in search, meaning the more people that see your result, like say maybe number nine, mm -hmm. the more people kind of click because they like what they see in the result because it's got more bling, mm -hmm. it can kind of pull itself up because okay. the click the click-through rate kind of brings itself, bootstraps itself. Okay. So, so you can see the amount. So somebody's got a list of like one to ten, and that one's coming up. Um, on number one, if more people start zeroing in and click that 10 result, mm -hmm. those clicks have a tendency to like pull it up on its own because everybody's skipping past one through nine yeah. and they're going to. And so the click through rate itself, people think, again, Google doesn't admit that it's a ranking factor, but mm -hmm. a lot of SEOs will say, hey, we see that this is a strong correlation for ranking. So, but the key to that is the more bling you can put in your search result. Mm -hmm. When you look at search result and you see like stars, yellow stars on the page, yeah. it just looks more sexy and more yeah. appealing. Yeah. So that by itself increases click-through rate, mm -hmm. which then also increases your ranking because people are clicking on it more. Yeah. So there's these little things, you should, and it doesn't take a whole lot of extra effort. Just do yeah. a blog post, add a couple more minutes to tag it. All of a sudden you got more information shown in search results. Mm -hmm. You're gonna pull yourself up more. You get more search engine signals and it's just wide open that way. So when people say it's dead. I'm just like, man, I think it's more, I think it's more <laughs> relevant than ever. ever you know, yeah. Google hasn't gone anywhere. They're just getting bigger and stronger and making more money. Yeah. Um, and I think Facebook and really Facebook and Google have almost become a monopoly and probably will will end up having some government intervention at some point because yeah. uh, there's so much people talking about advertisement abuse and fake news and things like that. Mm -hmm. Eventually, if they don't reel themselves in, um, they're probably going to have some government regulation, I think. But that just goes to show you, is it dead? No, it's not oh. dead. If somebody's a monopoly and has too much control, it's not because they're dying. It's because they're getting yeah. too strong. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I totally agree with you there. Totally agree with you there. That that's very interesting stuff. Cause I mean, I've already learned something today about uh, SEO, and I think I'm going to. I, I took you right down <laughs> into the weeds. Sorry. <laughs> no, I think I think it's great because a lot of times, you know, as business owners, you you know you have to do a web, especially if you're a solopreneur starting out. You're doing all these things. You put the website up, put the links in. You know, do your best to put the photo and everything right. But but you don't think at the level of granularity that an expert like you would say, oh, tagging actually helps you 
get better results because people and see it's it. not hard though. yeah it's just it's just a matter of can you make it a habit or not yeah if you can work it into your routine and not think about it then it yeah. just becomes part of your routine and you all of a sudden increase your ranking potential five or tenfold mm. because you take a couple extra steps once a week or every day when you go out and post stuff so yeah. not to sorry i mean to cut you but it, there is i there's just so much that people don't do okay that so they give sh- up sh- share, one, share one more thing that people don't do that can help like a local business owner that does a dentist or chiropractor or something so one little thing that they can do to help themselves I, the biggest thing the biggest thing of all all businesses is they put if they're going to do anything online mm-hmm. they put their best content on a platform they don't own mm. so it doesn't make sense to me that if you have a good piece of a good picture a good comment or something good that you wouldn't put that on your website and then share the link to facebook or twitter and make people come back, come to, back it. to you because there's multiple wins there and it's now it's on your site yeah. as a potential answer where if you put it up just only on facebook mm-hmm. it goes through the facebook river and dies there yeah. it doesn't it doesn't have any long term you know archive value yeah. for somebody to look up and you don't get that signal and there's all the things the traffic you don't get the ability to like get an email list for them or you don't get a chance to pixel them or reach mm-hmm. so you just lose so much opportunity mm-hmm. because they put, if they do anything they only put it on somebody else's platform yeah. and not theirs so huge benefit just by looking at your website as your own marketing platform mm-hmm. and not as a digital brochure if you can just if i just get people to think of their own website as a digital okay. asset and not not as a digital brochure, I think people would end up getting a lot more leads and traffic just by not ignoring it. Mm-hmm. But I think most people still build build websites. They're static and they just kind of sit there, yeah. you know. And if they're active, they just go up on social media and hope that works. But not yeah. people just don't. They don't use the website as their marketing hub. They don't think about that. And that's just. I think part of that's brainwashing yeah. on TV. I mean, go up to GoDaddy websites for fifty dollars a month, or Squarespace, or Weebly, and they're just like, you know, pay fifty bucks a month. So all you have to do, and we'll get you listed on Google. So people just, you know, are brainwashed. I think into thinking they're more like static mm-hmm. brochures and not not marketing platforms. And mm-hmm. I think that's the biggest. That's the biggest thing. Yeah, and if you spend your time in social media platforms, you end up building their business, spending yes. money with them, and you're not getting a piece of that action. Well, you might. Well, some people are smart enough to like try and transition people over to do business with them on their website. But basically, the more valuable you make Facebook, the more Facebook becomes more valuable. Well, even on Facebook, look, they just came out a couple of weeks ago and were like, they're basically killing a lot of the organic stuff on there, yeah. making you pay to play. So it's almost like you lose. But just by putting the source content on your website, you don't give anything up because when you share a link from your site, it looks like you post, you know, mm-hmm. you get the picture, you get the title, you get a little bit of snippet. It mm-hmm. looks like a post on your social media. Social media. It's just to see the rest of it. They got to come back to your site. Yeah. They don't get the whole post or all the content up on your website. So that's again that's one of those things where it doesn't take much any much extra time yeah it's just a matter of kind of working that piece into your routine and making sure that you're you know trying to add stuff to your website on a regular basis and yeah. not not on third party sites so. yeah nice so how did you get mixed up with the duct tape marketing well part of it was because the way google changed for 15 okay. years you know i'm kind of an introvert by nature i could get websites and have people come to my website, buy my services. They could literally write me a check and Mm -hmm. I could make their phone ring without ever having to meet or talk with them really. Um, But then Google had these punitive algorithms that came about five, six years ago. Think Panda and Penguin, right? And uh, some of these other ones that have came that really become more punitive in nature. Mm -hmm. And they really kind of put the bullseye on content, took it away from link building. So at that point, I think it was scary for a lot of us in SEO that were more passive marketers. But um, what ended up happening is the things that move the needle now are more holistic marketing. So blogging, you know, getting yourself out there, personal branding, um, social media participation mm-hmm. um, and all this kind of stuff. Where it's all of a sudden you got to kind of put yourself out there more because my, my first websites that I had for my own business, no blog, totally anonymous, mm-hmm. no pictures. Um, but Google could rank you on that. Now, if you go look at the Google, if you there's one to, to put up in there, there's one. Um, really interesting um, resource called the Google Search Evaluators Guidelines. Okay, so Google, it's really interesting. I love this, fascinating to me Mm -hmm. because Google hires about 10 to 15,000 independent contractors whose sole goal is to every day manually check the quality of search results. Okay. 
Well, they basically do a manual check, just run, do some searches and see if Google's algorithm is basically serving up to humans the way they think it was. So it's kind of a human cross check. But and the people that they hire are just regular people. So they're not hiring like space engineers and stuff. They're literally hiring in ten to fifteen dollars an hour. There's an army of them that do this. But there's a book that you can download for free, an ebook from right on Google server called you just type in search quality evaluator guidelines, 160 pages. It tells you exactly what people should look for on a website. And if you think about what they're trying to do, it's actually like a little window into the soul of the algorithm because mm. They talk about things and they tell people you have to um, know who did the website. Mm -hmm. You have to look. They use this acronym over and over again called EAT, EAT, Education, Authority, and Trust. Mm -hmm. Look through the website. Look for people educating. Look for blog posts. Look for pictures of people. Look for testimony. Mm -hmm. So all these things that they're telling the search about the actual person, mm -hmm. you know they want the algorithm to be able to pick that up on your website too. Okay. So those kind of things all of a sudden doesn't – they're not looking for – they don't tell you people to look for backlinks or look for more pages or look mm -hmm. for like keywords. They're telling them to look for these other things. Well, if you start reading through that document, all of a sudden the stuff they're making you look at looks a lot like – good marketing. Mm -hmm. It looks like social media. It looks like um, reputation management. Mm -hmm. You know, It looks yeah. like content management. So all of a sudden I started seeing these things and I was like, well, I have to become a better like holistic marketer to do yeah. well on Google now. Not just one of these guys who can hack the algorithm from mm -hmm. the keywords you know, and the pages and that kind of stuff. I actually have to become a good marketer mm -hmm. and understand mm -hmm. things like who an ideal client is, what yeah. kind of content they consume, and stuff like that is kind of what, what John's been preaching since like 2005. Yeah. It's just all of a sudden the content marketers that a lot of us SEO people are like, yeah, social media, yeah, content marketing. You know, Google talks about content as king. They don't really mean it. Mm -hmm. But after P Panda and Penguin came, they really meant yeah, it, which means that. guys like me had to start <laughs> really looking at the whole marketing picture yeah. in order to survive in SEO because that's what SEO has come, become now. Mm -hmm. It hasn't died. It's just become holistic, holistic digital marketing. Yeah. Right. So, and that's, that's, that's why I became a duct tape marketer. Cause I was like, that was going to bring me up to speed quicker and get me to understand like the whole marketing picture mm -hmm. um, versus just these little SEO blinders that I had, you know, um, for the years before, before I joined. Oh, okay. So the application of that, it, it broadened your perspective you were able to apply more things to grow your business in terms of looking at creating content putting yourself out there podcasts interviews summits etc were there any other would you say unusual things you learned by participating in duct tape marketing that you found very valuable as a business owner well two things strike me as life-changing for me one is um how a, writing a book and a series of books has changed the game and really separated me. Cause at this point it's like really easy to, you know, I'm the only guy in town here in Kansas city that has multiple best selling books. So yeah. immediately when people sit down with a web design firm and I can drop down, it just totally separates, you know, from everybody else. So become much easier to close people and actually brought clients in from all sorts of other places. So being able to seeing how that works to, raise your personal brand and literally make you prove to people in their hands they're holding your authority basically yeah. whether it's not it's real or not the perceived authority right. is like they see it right there yeah. um, so it helps get business it helps close business like more than anything else and it helps me open doors um, and then so that that's been huge um, and the whole process of I think writing a book's been really big because one it's a lot easier than I thought it would be oh, with wow. create space and Amazon Two, the ability to go and do what I call endorsement marketing was huge because the first bestseller that we had, uh, Small Business Marketing Guide, Local Lead Generation, opened my eyes because I, when I, I went out, all of a sudden, I went on a whim and I, I just started to go ask people that didn't know who I was, would you give us an endorsement as the book since you're an influencer in this mm -hmm. niche? So many people said yes that would have never answered my email. Um, on there and I was like wow this is so easy yeah. because then I realized well the more I ask people as an expert to leave as an endorsement mm -hmm. the more I'm reaffirming their influence yeah. so they're actually appreciative that you're asking them mm -hmm. and it just became so much easier so we did that a little bit with the first book but then I was like wow we should have really done this a lot more mm -hmm. yeah. and then, then we did it with John with SEO for growth and got so many people to endorse it but what was interesting with it is it wasn't the, the book endorsements aren't are great bling for the book, but what really, where we really struck gold is the people, if you ask them, some of them will help you market the book when it comes out. Hmm. So a lot of the endorsees 
that were had their own um, communities. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them like Larry Kim, big word stream guy, I think is yeah. one of the biggest. He, you know, put us in their email. He promoted us on there, gave us an ebook that we get give away. So yeah. I mean, just yeah, so I his. Need, I need to have him that. on. I have him connected on LinkedIn. Sorry for that. But I need to have. Yeah, him. Larry Kim. He's great because yeah. he's really he's really out there, but. Yeah. And we got like over 50. So that endorsement marketing lets you get in there, um, contact people, and it's really a lot more easy to get. And not everybody says yes, but yeah. it's a lot easier to get than you think. I was like, people are just going to say no, no, no. But more than half of them said yes. Yeah. Um, so when we wrote the SEO for Growth book, I took it so far. Um, we got over 50 uh, endorsements from top from top influencers. I went at the end, at the end of every book, there's 16 chapters. We mm -hmm. purposely named an expert in every niche. Okay. So Larry's one, Rand Fishkin's one, um, you know, Brian Clark, he wrote mm -hmm. the four, we got a bunch of people out there. And because we made them and made, gave them like a whole page as the rec, as the, um, recommended expert to watch at the end of each chapter yeah. we kind of made them part of the book, book yeah. and we sent them to here's what we're going to write about you then they actually responded back and said that's great here let me change this they kind of became part of the project they helped us a lot of them helped us because mm -hmm. we actually put the endorse and then we also cited over 200 different people and resources and then we contacted them yeah. and let them know they were in the book mm -hmm. so all these people that we made part of the book we reached out to them at the book launch and a lot of them helped us amplify it mm -hmm. So, kind so of it was like just collaboration. Exactly. You know, people, if you tell people, hey, you wrote this great post, we actually included it in our book. It was so good. They're happy. Yes. They'll, they you send them a copy of the book, they'll mention it. They'll give yeah. you a shout out. You know, and all of a sudden you reaffirm their authority because yeah. you wrote a book on a subject and then they became part of to prove your case. So it just worked out really well. Yeah. So we're very deliberate. If you read this book, I mean, the coolest thing about the book that we wrote is. I don't think it's so much about the content's great and it's all in there, but if you look at it in terms of how we optimize it for sale mm -hmm. and how we leveraged all the people that we mentioned in it, I think that's where we really did a, a better job than most people. Because I think most people don't think of like writing a book no. and using it that way. No, you don't. Um, but and all of a sudden you do it all and tie it all the same thing. All of a sudden, you know, a two week period we become a bestseller. It yeah. still ranks like number three, I think, for if you type in SEO on Amazon. But um, but that really works. So that and, and you mentioned duct tape. Writing that book, writing those books, being able to leverage that group, seeing how that helps you change your career and open things up. And really, um, I think it's a fast track to authority and personal branding. Okay. And it opens other doors like right now. Like I've been able I've been on over probably close to 60 podcasts right now oh, because I got a cool little angle yeah. to pitch at people. Right. So yeah. and then all of a sudden you get on somebody's show and you get leveraged to their audience and yeah. they do show notes about you and you get backlinks from the show and it helps your ass. So it all kind of like, you know, feeds on each other. All of a yeah. sudden it's like, wow, um, if you got that angle from from the book thing. So to me, the two biggest things that have from duct tape have come book, you know, personal branding and authority, and then also really podcasting mm -hmm. and podcast guesting and having my own podcast now, yeah. uh, because here locally, you know, I purposely did this this year, local, business, lo local business, local podcast? business leaders. Yeah. It's okay. called local business leaders. And the reason I named it that way is because, you know, last year we tried to hire just to see, I just, as an experiment, I hired an outbound salesperson because okay. like, oh, I got so many reviews, so many good track record. If we just call people and let them know how good we are, they're going to, more people are going to hire us and we'll really grow this business, mm -hmm. you know, fast this year. Didn't work that way. Wow. You cold call people that it's just, it's impossible unless you've got a really good give. And then what we noticed is I started doing this local business leaders podcast. You call the same people and say, I want to have your CEO on the local business leaders podcast. Four out of five people say yes. Wow. Because you're putting them on a show so, versus can I sell you a website? Yes. And so, all of a sudden, I get to talk to somebody for 30 minutes. They have to come to my website to review it and see what we do. All of a sudden, you get more leads. So those kind of things of like like you say, what has – then that all kind of came through the duct tape experience of yeah. content marketing, yeah. writing a book, trying to figure out ways. When you do stuff once, don't just do it for a book. Do it for lots of reasons mm. and make sure that you squeeze out every bit of value and don't just look at it in a one-dimensional way. Mm. Um, that's, I think what, what I got out of duct tape that really kind of changed my thinking on that and helped us. Um, now it's to the point where it's like, we literally have so much leads coming in that I don't, I have to turn stuff away. And it's like, that drives you crazy. Cause yeah. it's like, that's money going no, out the table. Exactly. Cause we're not set up to, to do it. So there's, you know, careful what you wish for type of a thing, but, yeah. um, 
You know, I love what you just said about the podcasting thing being a local leader. I think I'm actually going to to steal that, steal that, steal that because <laughs> that's just. Good. I'm I'm new in a new city. I I don't have a lot of connections. I'm starting a new business. I might as well interview local business leaders. So for somebody listening to this and you're saying, dude, that's a good idea. Let me take that what he's doing in Kansas. Steal it. Steal Let it me away. Do it in man. Lynchburg. Let me do it in Tallahassee. Yes. Wherever you want to do it, Toronto, Mississauga, wherever. How how would that person transition from interviewing them to now making that sales presentation or turning that okay. interviewee into a lead? Because that is something that I know a lot of people are scared of. Of doing i love this i love this and if you look check out my podcast yeah. look Local at the first leaders. yeah but look at the first episode that i did it's mm-hmm. only five minutes long and if you listen to the five minute podcast you will see how i'm using that to convert people because what i do is i invite them on the show and i say before you come on the show mm-hmm. please listen to episode one it yeah. shows you what the expectation is okay. and in that five minute podcast i tell people Here's an example of the bio you want to give me. Mm-hmm. And I actually read my bio to them and I say, here's how I help small businesses grow. So they're listening to my sales pitch mm. as an example of what, you know, as a soft sell yeah. of what they're doing. And all of a sudden people are and it's happened already three times where it's like, why? Wow, tell us, can you can you tell us how you can help our, you know, that type mm-hmm. of thing because they kind of see it. Mm-hmm. But I pull them in from will you be on the show? Sure. And I use the preparation podcast. Mm-hmm as a soft pitch because they have to listen to it or I recommend that they listen to it Mm -hmm. um, so that they know what to expect. And I tell them in the five minute thing, here's the questions I'm going to ask. But in the middle of it, it's like provide us with a three or five sentence bio and my bio when it's reading back to them. They're listening to me say what I, and I basically read the bio that you read at the beginning. Here's what we do. We help small businesses grow by providing these services and turning their websites into legion. All of a sudden it's like, Wow, you know they they just got trapped into that. Yeah, not as a trap, but it's a great way to get catch their attention. Yeah, and you have their attention because a lot of them have never been on a podcast before, yeah. so they're actually listening to it really yeah. closely. You know what I mean? So that I think, and it works, man. It's working for me. It's just so amazing how it's so hard to do outbound sales, mm. but it's really easy if you have a strong give. Yeah. So if you call somebody up and say I want to sell you a website, every time it's like eh, eh. if you call somebody up and say. I've got a show where we showcase local mm-hmm. business leaders like your CEO. Can we get him on the show? Mm-hmm. It's almost yes, almost every time. You know, at least they're flattered. They'll take your call yeah. and they'll listen to you type of thing. A lot of times they'll at least check it out and check your email out. So it's really work. I've only done 10 episodes right now. Mm-hmm. So um, and I got sick with the flu. I'm so interested in getting back into yeah. it because I was, this is so cool how it's working. And yeah. um, I, I recommend everybody to steal. And I have to give a shout out to, um, to one click Lindsay Anderson because she's been doing this. If you go to the I've PDX heard her name before, one click yeah. Lindsay, yeah. She has one. And I stole this idea from her. She does it in Portland. Okay. She moved to Portland like last year. Yeah. And she's getting so many clients because she started one called the local Portland Business Exchange. Mm. And she calls people up and has them on the show and she just gets so many people to you know, it's just a natural thing at the yeah. end where people ask a little bit about you. And if you've got something to offer, yeah. then and a good call to action, a good follow up strategy, okay. um, you can get clients off. I think everybody should be doing this because oh. it's, it's it's like I, said, I spent three months and a lot of money hiring somebody individually to make <laughs> 50 phone calls a day. And it didn't work. One meeting, one meeting in three months. Unbelievable. Wow. And podcasting, it's, I've got more people lined up than I know what to do with now. Dude, so, yeah. No, I love that strategy. I think we'll talk about it, and I'll also contact Lindsay to get on this podcast too. Because steal, yeah, steal it, her son. It, it's 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 a great strategy. It's very simple, and it's also very flattering because you make the person a star in front of yes. their community wherever they live. You know, because usually it will take a lot to get somebody on radio or TV, but once you get a, somebody on a podcast, which is low pressure like this. You can yeah. now say, hey, send the link to your friends and family, you know, give them like a nice, um, there's somebody that does a nice cover art with every person they have on, yes. their, on their podcast. And you're and, giving them yeah, so much. You're giving, giving them, them I mean, publicity. You're making them a celebrity, so to speak. And as they're a but celebrity. I, I do think just... the name mm-hmm. that you choose for this kind of thing is really important. Okay. Because like, look at my, who's not, who doesn't want to be on the local, local. who in Kansas City doesn't want to be a local business leader, yeah. right? Yeah. I didn't name it web design for authority or mm-hmm. SEO or marketing. Yeah. I specifically named it 
a sexy name because mm-hmm. it's when I when we pitch it, it the name itself is like I want to be on that mm-hmm. right because I'm so it's something like that. I think that makes a big difference is make that kind of a vanity name that appeals to your potential ideal client and elevates them. Yeah. Um, cause I think that is a big part of what I really thought about what well, doesn't make a lot of sense with me trying to like do this piece of it. But if I just do it for this reason, um, it's going to make, and it's works. It does. Yeah. It totally works because you know, no, every, any small business or medium sized business out there wants to be every, and you build on this authority thing. We all know that we've got to build our own authority and separate yeah. ourselves from somebody else. So it doesn't have to be this. Obviously there's lots of different names you can play off, but yeah. I do think the name is really important. If you see some other that don't make sense, it doesn't matter if you're inviting them on their show. If they don't yeah. see that it's got some kind of feeds into their vanity or ego a little bit or it helps separate them, it's probably not going to be as attractive, yeah. you know, proposition. Man, I, it's at the top of the hour. <laughs> All right, man. I, we could go I, on and on. I, I wish we could go on forever. Maybe we'll have you so come back. So much for Valentine's yeah. Day. <laughs> Maybe I'll have you come back. We'll do a follow-up episode. I think that'll be great because honestly speaking, I've, I've just been like, wow, give me some more, give me some more. <laughs> but, but it's February 14th, it's Valentine's Day. I'm sure you're going to have to spend some quality time with your wife. I have to go on a little quick date. Um, before I let you go, uh, give us some words of wisdom for Valentine and then tell us where people can find you, get to know more about you, your business, and of course, get your books. I, it's, I, really, feel, I, I really feel like I need Valentine's advice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, versus giving it to him. Cause like we were saying in the green room before the show, uh, it's become so much more about kids right now. Yeah. That, uh, and this is a blessing in disguise. I'm not think I'm going to do something from me and my wife that I haven't done. Well, I'm going to give her a nice little, nice little gift or some, something to bring home that I think she really will be surprised. But, um, my advice on Valentine's Day is not to follow any advice that I have. Cause it's not going to be very good. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, come on. You must have had some little, Trick up your sleeve when you first went, met your oh, wife, or you took out wear a red shirt, I guess. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and other stuff, you know, check out my site, caseywebdesigner.com. Check out um, caseseopro.com is where I sell SEO services. Mm-hmm. Please check out the book site, oh, SEO for Pro. Uh, dot com. It's then, free now on Kindle Unlimited. So if you have Kindle Unlimited, uh, yeah, uh, what's it called? Prime, I think you get Kindle right. Unlimited. Yeah, yeah so, books free. so get that. And, it's a uh, very good read. Check out, you know, if you're interested, especially start your own podcast, see how I've done it because my whole podcast yes. is really about targeted, you know, inbound, outbound, lead generation. And, yeah. and, and half, of, half of it is trying to get CEOs and leadership. The other half is trying to get mm-hmm. marketing tips and advice from marketers. But um, mm-hmm. but I think I've stolen some pretty good ideas from other yeah. people. And I've I added think some this, honestly, from what you just said, I'm thinking to myself, dude, walk into your local chamber of commerce Kansas City, whatever, where business people are meeting, you just say, hey, I have a local business podcast, you know, would you like to come on the show, talk about your business and your perspectives on life, and etc. And that's, that's exactly, that's it. You're not, exactly you're not taking Lindsay anything did. from, yes. from them, you're just giving them. Call, do contact Lindsay, she, she loves podcasts, you do back to back, but she, she did that exact same thing, she was like, she she mentioned I was getting crickets and stuff. All of a sudden, she she walked into this meeting and mentioned that she had, and everybody was like, "I'll be on this show," you know, that type of thing. And she, all of a sudden, she had, you know, a couple months worth of yeah. people that were trying to get on it. So great idea. Yeah. I mean, I haven't done that yet myself, but it's on the list. So yeah, cool. Well, Phil, my friend, Thanks, it's, it's been a pleasure having you for one hour. I know we're going to talk for thirty minutes, but man, I know. <laughs> the com- conversation was just What's so that? interesting. <laughs> I do want to have you come back again. So we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more about some other esoteric stuff that you have. And I want to have you on my podcast after you've done some, if you end up doing this. No, I'm going to, I'm I'm going to do it by next. I'm going to hire somebody to do cover art. I already came up with the name uh, because I'm in greater Toronto area. So it's going to be called the GTA business giants or something, something along those lines. So I'm just going to get somebody to do the artwork right now. And then I have the whole thing set up. I'll pay for. Um, I'd love to have you on my show to oh, talk about how you did that. Yeah, be a pleasure um, to because come because just to get some more ideas and steal okay. in it. And okay. I actually have one of the podcasts on my show. My only I've got ten. Lindsay is one of them. We talk about what we're talking about right now. Okay. But anyway, man, we can go on. I'm gonna, yeah, go, no, go to Valentine's Day. Go, no, go no, do no, your no, thing. no, no. I'm going. I'm going to send you an email, and then within two weeks, once once I get the artwork and everything rolling, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit you back up and say, let me get on, on your my show. Out. All right, yes. sweet. Cool. Phil, my friend, thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure. It's a blast. Have a great day, and I look forward to talking to you. And of course, please, if you know anybody else on your on your group in duct tape marketing that is interested in being interviewed, send them my way, and yeah. I, I'd love to have to talk to them. 
All right, man. Great. Have a great day. Have a good, have a good Valentine's Day. Bye. All right, see you. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the show today. If you love what you hear on today's episode of the podcast, go to iTunes and leave a review and a comment. It helps other great listeners like yourself find the show. And of course, you can always find more episodes of the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Podcast at www.odogwu.com.